Welcome to another episode of ResX, an indigenous lifestyle show for everyone. My name is Cadmus Delorme. And I'm your co-host, Aaron Goodpipe. On today's show, we have the 2015 Indigenous Games in Alberta. We will be looking at a team that is playing lacrosse. Standing buff, my own team actually. <laughs> um, as well as we have a panel on the importance of fatherhood. And we have some mad bannock making skills happening on this episode. AKA fire safety by myself. <laughs> so Aaron, <laughs> have you made bannock before? I have actually. Okay. Um, yeah, well I can burn water, so I'm, <laughs> it's really interesting to so see me make bannock. I can, from getting, getting that story, do you play hockey with your bannock when you're done? Hockey, yeah, it's well, it's, it like it's either really soft it's hard. or it's really hard, so <laughs> we'll I, see. I'm not bad at making grease bannock. Grease, gr grease or baked oven? Grease bannock, so, so like deep fried, mm, you hey, know, deep fried a little bannock. different than the donuts you'd see at the exhibition. <laughs> Bit tougher. I'm, uh, I'm mad skills. Okay. Oh, but my first batch, some, somewhat are doughy, I gotta give it a little tester, <laughs> but by about the tenth a piece, so bon appetit. Bon appetit, you're in Bannock heaven, in ditch heaven, I should say. <laughs> but I'm excited for the show. I am too. You know, I'm sure our audience would like to see what's, uh, mm -hmm. what's about to happen, so let's get it started. Check it out, guys. Let's get started. Our first story is on the 2015 Alberta Indigenous Games, which is the first time ResX travels outside the province of Saskatchewan. These summer games were held in Edmonton, Alberta. Check it out. My name is, is Marnie Ross and I was a general manager for the Alberta Indigenous Games in 2015. It was a really amazing week. We started off the event with an Eagle Staff run um, that was run uh, just uh, the city limits of Edmonton, kind of near Poundmakers Lodge. Uh, and we had a group of athletes that came out to, to uh, do the Sacred Lance run. Alberta Indigenous Games is a, is a multi-sport event that celebrates um, culture, sport, and youth. And our theme for our games was coaching youth in life, sport, and culture, and careers. Given that that was our theme, we had, a very, we had our opening ceremonies at Rundle Park, and we had uh, a lot of dignitaries from uh, the city of Edmonton, from surrounding First Nations and, uh, and, our, and our First Nations leadership, as well as the athletes who were able to make it to, uh, um, able to make it to the opening ceremony. We had seven different sports. Uh, we had volleyball, basketball, ball hockey, athletics, canoeing, archery, and golf. So we had those, we had seven sports, and we had a, uh, approximately about 500 athletes come out to, to our event. Alberta Indigenous Games unique from other sporting events is not only is it an event uh, for Indigenous youth, but it's a it's it's a sport development uh, it's it's a sport development organization, and and we and what that means is that we want to keep the participation circle as large as possible. moment because um, you know uh, Alan is uh, he's the CEO of, uh, of the Alberta Indigenous Games and the Edmonton Native Ball Association. He's the CEO and he's the founder of the games um, uh, as we see them now and he has been involved in Aboriginal sport for um, over 40 years. Um, um, being uh, born and bred from Saskatchewan, you know, uh, he's from Timber Bay, and uh, he's, uh, he's, he's spent uh, most of his, his adult life coaching and uh, really has the heart uh, for Aboriginal youth. Hey, 
Well, that was awesome, guys. Next up, we have our very own Roger Ross, who traveled to Calgary to see members of Standing Buffalo compete in a national lacrosse championship. Let's have a look. We want to play the game in a ferocious manner, but we want to play it in a respectful way. We have a saying in our chants, what's this game all about? And the players and everyone calls out respect. My name is Russ Matthews. I am a teacher and director of lacrosse at Standing Buffalo School. We introduced lacrosse at Standing Buffalo seven years ago, and we started with a novice team, which is 10 and under. And when they graduated to Pee Wee 12 and under, then we filled that under with a novice team, and then they graduated to Bantam, which is 14 and under. And now we have three teams playing in each of the divisions in the Queen City Minor Box Cross League. We started going to the Calgary Canada Day Lacrosse Tournament. It's the biggest lacrosse tournament in the world. There's over 100 teams in four different divisions. California sends a state all-star team. Denver sends a state all-star team. There's fantastic teams out of BC and Alberta. We won it the first time in 2011 with our novice group, and then we won it two years later in 2013 with our Pee Wee group, and then we won it again this season in 2015 with our Bannon groups. We've had a lot of success there. Uh, it's not the only tournament we enter. We, we go to Saskatoon, we enter uh, provincials and, and other tournaments as well, but we've really had a, uh, some, some good luck in Calgary for sure. And Standing Buffalo, we believe in the power of sport. We believe in the value of recreation. We know that sport is good for you, that there are many benefits to participating in sport. The lacrosse program is part of the whole community, that we have survivors and volunteers that do the coaching, the managing, working the score clock, the penalty boxes, cooking meals. Everybody's involved at Standing Buffalo. And if you want to have a successful sports program on a First Nation or a community that's marginalized from sport, then uh, it has to be uh, from the community and for the community. And that what makes our Standing Buffalo program so successful is that there's so many people involved that make it happen. But we see it as an opportunity for our children and our students to grow. We see it as an opportunity for our families to have something to hold on to together. And it helps to give our community an identity and something that we can strive for together as a group with a common goal. Amazing. Always really good to see kids playing sports. These kids are thriving at a game of lacrosse. Did you know that lacrosse was created by the first people here in North America? Lacrosse has been played long before Canada was a country. The first people, the indigenous people, would play lacrosse for competition, for bragging rights. It was a unity, it was coming together, as well as many other games. So seeing these kids continue at a sport that has been played here in North America for centuries, amazing. Keep up the good work. Stay tuned, we have res experts that will have a panel on the importance of fatherhood. We'll be right back. At Access, we love technology. Not the kind that costs an arm and a leg and does stuff you don't need. The kind that makes your life easier and more fun. Like the new Access Evo. You won't believe what this box holds for you. Hey guys, next up we have an important topic. Fatherhood. Our very own Shawnee and Pete and Chris Ross traveled to Carry the Kettle Pow Wow to see what people had to say about that. As well, we have the res experts on a panel to discuss their experiences. What's the importance of fatherhood for you guys? Check it out. First question, I'm going to ask you for a memory, a story of your own father, or if you want to comment sure. on the importance of fatherhood. I definitely would like to do that as I was raised by my grandparents. My grandfather was my father to me. He raised me. And I believe it's very important for our fathers all across Indian country to stand up to teach, to talk, to role model, to be a part of their children's lives or their grandchildren's lives. Because it's because of my grandparents that I am here today, that I stand here as an Indian woman, a part of my culture, enjoying it, knowing who I am. It's my grandparents who instill the values in me, and that's why I believe it's important for fatherhood to, to have role models. I would say my fondest memories of my dad was uh, 
we got nominated to the uh, Grammy Awards and well seven time Grammy nominations and the first one he we walked in and he didn't know what to expect because you know he doesn't know the new genre of music and mainstream music so people were walking by him and we're all saying oh look there's Kid Rock oh look there's you know all these groups and he didn't know what was going on and so he was sitting there talking with people, getting them to sign autographs, and they weren't even famous people. Could you, could you mind t sharing with us a little bit about one of your favorite memories as a father? Uh, favorite memory? Probably uh, taking my son to hockey all the time. Uh, now that he's older, I, I really missed it. But hockey was probably one of the best things between us, you know, going to watch him play. And through all the years of watching him grow up, that was the most enjoyable time of my life, I think. Uh, first of all, my favorite memory with my father is riding horses with him here, you know, going all over the place. We, uh, back home in Sioux Valley, we have, uh, we have a lot of horses, so my first memory of with my, my father is riding horses with him all the time, fixing fence and doing all that stuff. So I was close to my dad, you know, him and I would get everything together. My fatherhood figure, the one that I grew up with, was my grandfather. My grandparents raised me. And so my grandfather was there and until he too succumbed to illness. And I was just a preteen when that happened. But he left me with so much uh, memories that uh, has shaped me into who I am. And one of, the, one of the areas is my language and culture. He really instilled that in me. And that's what I grew up to be, is I'm a language warrior and that's my specialization with education and i continue to fight for my language and because i know how important that is and and also all our cultural um, activities and events and our protocols and our ceremonies and all of that i really hold dear to my heart because with it instills the memories that i have of my grandparents and my grandfather thank you so much for your story today really appreciate it thank you thank you guys Sitting with me, I have the res experts, Mr. Jay Bird, Dr. Shawneen Pete, and Chris Ross. Uh, Shawneen and Chris, uh, when you were doing your um, interviews at Carry the Kettle First Nation Pow, tell, tell us about it. Well, we were interviewing uh, individuals about either a memory of their father or an experience in fatherhood, and we heard all kinds of great stories. Um, and I think for me, one of the things that was most memorable about that uh, event was how willing people were to have that conversation with us. Um, the stories were really quite wonderful. They were poignant. They were mm -hmm. um, very deeply meaningful um, and touching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like just like the one father with the two uh, young girls, you know, uh, just how like just a single dad just going to powwow so that they can get involved into powwow mm -hmm. just just things like that you know i mean that serves a really good purpose for those young girls when they get older so awesome. the importance mm -hmm. of fatherhood jay please jump into the conversation father of two um i think the importance of father is it's always good to have like that male figure in your in your life as well um a lot of us were raised either by single mothers or two parent families mm -hmm. but i know a lot of people have had just single parent families and sometimes you just need that, that extra role. I think guys do bring something to the table as a parent. Mm -hmm. um, I'm in a, parent, in a family where I have, to have daughters, two daughters, and I'm the father and we have a mother figure. Mm -hmm. And I find that both parties do things a little bit differently, mm -hmm. but you need both aspects. You need to have that fun-loving person and who's also kind of disciplinary at points. You need that other person to be fun-loving and disciplinary, but they're done in different ways and in unique ways and in some of the social stuff between a, a women and men are different as well. Mm -hmm. You need to have both. Um, I think it's very healthy for a child to have both, actually. The balance. The balance I, is nice. I yeah. know as a child, um, if I wasn't listening to my mom, she would tell me, don't make me tell your dad. And that's <laughs> when I would listen. <laughs> Not that I didn't listen to my mom, but she used my dad as a, an authoritative kind of figure. And uh, my dad never, ever hit me, but I what? was always afraid of my dad because mm -hmm. that, that kept me in line as a young male growing up and you know today my dad's more of a best friend to me so um what's um 
you know, people always kind of say men do this and women do that. Um, when you're a father, you know, you, you have roles that, you know, it doesn't matter what gender you come from. Uh, tell me a story, Shawnee, of, of, of a role maybe that a father or a male played, you know, as you growing up that really allowed you to understand um, parenting is very important. You know, my story would be about being an adult and my dad and I starting to go to ceremony together. Mm -hmm. So my dad would take me back to the reserve and we started to go to sweats together. Mm -hmm. It was part of his healing, but it was also part of my healing. And mm -hmm. I was so pleased that he gave me that opportunity to learn to reconnect mm -hmm. um, with our family members and with our community, but to learn um, a ceremonial way of life. And I'm really, really thankful for that. And again, that teaching comes later on in life too. And so your role as a father is always going mm -hmm. to be um, an essential one for your children. Mm -hmm. and I hope that you hear that and are inspired by that as well. For sure. Um, learning the traditional roles, uh, when I mean traditional, um, pre, uh, you know, where we live in the society of today, men played the role of protecting women and children, um, you know, and that, you know, how do you feel, Chris, uh, really quickly, um, that role has transpired into today? Well, I think it's just, uh, you know, um, sometimes it's role reversals in different, uh, fields or different families right but I mean if there's anything I can say about fatherhood I mean we haven't really touched on it is, is that uh, there are a lot of uh, Aboriginal uh, kids that grow up without their fathers right. right and sometimes that leads to negative lifestyles that mm -hmm. leads to like finding other families mm -hmm. like in this like gangs for example mm -hmm. you know and that because that's a reality of mm -hmm. it I mean but the thing is what, what our young fathers can do to really um, stop that or to really help bring up our children a lot more mm -hmm. just to be that father you know just for to sure. kind of be there in their life for and that's sure. kind of like what i would the message i would give out to young fathers well, thank you so. you know um there's always someone to look up to well, i'd like mm -hmm. to thank our res experts for sitting with us today and sharing your thoughts thank you very much great discussion on fatherhood I myself can relate to that and the various fathers in my life i know that i would not be here if it weren't for the various fathers in my life Stay tuned for more Resex. You get to see me show some fire safety and make panic. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Our next feature is about making Bannock, film maker, entrepreneur, member of Gordon's First Nation, Mr. Roger Ross, shows our very own Aaron Goodpipe on how to make a fresh batch of Bannock. Check it out. Welcome to the ResX Cook Show. I'm your co-host Aaron Goodpipe and I'm with the awesome Roger Ross, who I hear is a professional storyteller, artist, businessman. Geez, you've got so much going on. Yeah. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, Roger? Well, I don't know about professional storyteller. Okay. I do know, um, and I do get asked to to tell traditional stories. Okay. Like I, I have some creation stories and Raven stories that have been gifted to me over the wow. years. And uh, I've been a film producer for 33, 34 years now. Wow. You know, so yeah, storyteller uh, of sorts. And I hear you're a good cook too, so. Well, I, uh, yeah. I guess we should, uh, I wanted to know before we start getting this, this organic Bannock stuff going on here, um, <laughs> did you know a little bit about the, the history of it? Cause even you know, I what, really know. It, what I know about Bannock is, you know, I, I've actually been to Scotland and in particular the Orkney Islands. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that the, uh, the Scottish people and the or Orcadians were the ones who brought Bannock to us. Mm -hmm. uh, and, we, and we like to tease, you know, that they introduced us to Bannock, but we perfected it. Should we get started? Do you let's, want to show me how? Let's get started. Uh, you know, I want to, I, I got to thank, you know, Dr. Shani and Pete, you know, she brought us some measuring cups <laughs> and all this stuff. So that's really cool. But this stuff here, we're just going to put that over there, all right? <laughs> yeah. I'm going to grab one of these and we're going to go old school mm, with this, all right? The indigenous right? measuring yeah, here, cup, guys. There you go. That's, that's the cup right there. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with some flour. Okay. So grab, grab a couple of cups and I'm just going to do this. Okay, so oh. you got your measurements there? There's Which one. Yeah. That's one cup. One cool. cup, guys. Okay, let's do two of those. Okay. Right, actually, you know what? Let's make three. So we got three cups of flour yeah. so far. Indigenous cups of yeah, flour, indigenous guys. Indigenous cups. <laughs> Good enough. Let's put that off Which to the side. Enough. Okay, so as you can see, we got almost the same, right? Mm -hmm. That's pretty close. 
There we go. Yeah. That's pretty close. Okay, so now our other dry ingredient. Okay, now normally, you know, we got like all these fancy things, and I think that's like, well, that's too big for a teaspoon. <laughs> so what we're gonna do, here's an actual spoon, so okay. you can use that. Thank you. Okay, so you do uh, do two of those. Two of these, okay. Yeah. Good, perfect, cool. Okay, so now I'll grab mine, so we're good to go. Now, we got this fancy, fancy sea salt. sea salt, so we're just gonna throw some of that in there. Now that's pretty coarse, you know, right? So what we'll do, just to make sure that we got it spread out pretty good, we'll just put a little bit of salt in there. You know, you don't have to measure that bit. too much, just enough to taste, Okay. All right? We don't wanna kill anybody. Okay, so you <laughs> take your fork, and we're just gonna mix all this dry ingredients. Hey. So you can do I that with, with a fork, or you can just do this. That's it. Oh, you know, we've got, we need some water, so we'll have to get that in a bit, but we'll okay. get there. Alrighty. We, uh, we need a little bit of oil. Okay. And I, I'm, I use cooking oil. Uh, you can use, you know, traditionally most people use lard. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking about a little more healthier diets. So we're going to use a little bit of canola oil. Okay. Now let's use a tablespoon. And okay. you can use like two of those. There's one and there's two. Now that's how you do it and okay. this is how I do it. <laughs> okay, so now we're just going to mix yeah. that together. Okay. Okay, and you, and you got to squeeze this so that okay. you spread the oil around really good. Okay, that's gotta get like all in there. Takes a little longer to do this part. So where did you learn how to make bannock? You know what, I used to watch my, my, my grandma. My mom's family are Métis. Oh. So you know, bannock was a big thing for our family. You know, and my, and my, my grandmas, I called them grandmas, uh, my, my mom's mom and my mom's grandma. So they used to cook and, and you know, when I was a kid, I was always around them and mm -hmm. uh, watch them cook. And the other thing I used to like to do, I used to like watch cooking shows. Mm, what was your favorite? I, well, I didn't really have a favorite, but uh, but I liked the Galloping Gourmet. Galloping yeah, Gourmet? Yeah, from back in the day. Jeez, so, I wonder what we should call our cooking show. I don't know. Mm. I don't know. Mm. Walk with Aaron. Walk with Aaron? Yeah, burn stuff down <laughs> with Aaron. What do you guys? Burning with Aaron. <laughs> we, got, we got a texture. You can okay. squeeze it together and then do that. Do that? See it fall apart. See, there you go. See, that's, that's good. Actually that's pretty how you good. tell? That's pretty good. Okay. Okay, now we're going to take a little break here because we got to get some water and we're going to mix it up. Okay, so I'm actually going to fill this up with water. Okay, so we have water. So we're going to mix that up a little more. Okay. Sometimes the flour gets, you know, caught up in the bottom of the bowl. and right. You know, so you want to move it around really good. Yeah. Just so that it's, you know, the oil's mixed in there really good, the shortening or whatever you're going to use. Mm. Then you've got a really nice consistency. So is there a difference between um, making oven bannock versus fried bannock? When it comes to bannock and fried bannock, no, there isn't. Once you have the dough, then you can you know, just section it off, make little patties and then mm -hmm. put little slices in it, and then you put that in the hot oil, right? And then it'll just pop up, you flip it over. Mm -hmm. uh, with baked bannock, it's a little more healthy for you because you're not cooking it in oil. Right, right? right. it's not good. So, you know, for me, I like, I've always liked baked bannock. I, I like fried bannock too. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make a little hole, you know, kind of a, a little catch hole, right? So you can blow all the flour off to the side. So you got a little holding area for the water. Yeah. So now we're going to put some water in there and I'm just going to fill it to about like that much. Okay. Okay. So that's like a cup of water. So you take your fork and you just kind of ease it in there. All right. So you mix it around and you'll start to get consistency you're looking for. So you just kind of mm. keep it, keep adding a little more and then mix it. So you're going to start to see it's going to get thick. Right? It's mm -hmm. gonna go from, from really, really, you know, kind of runny, then it's gonna turn into, you know, pancake dough, mm -hmm. and then it's gonna get even heavier than that. As you do it gradually, you'll get the consistency where it starts to almost string up, right? right yeah. So once you get to that oh. point, oh. then you get your hands dirty. And then you just start kneading the flour in from the edges. All right. Okay? And you just work it in there like that. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a little bit of flour okay. and we're going to put it on the counter like this. Where it gets nice and right? messy. So we're going to spread that around. Exactly. And then take your bannock. My poor bannock! Yeah, that's yeah. okay. So I'm going to help you with that. We're going to mix it a <laughs> bit more. Okay? So what you want to do is knead it. Okay, knead okay? it. Okay? And then just roll it back over on itself and do it again. Okay. Right? And then you're just going to do that. And then just keep shaping it up like this. See that? Yeah. We're taking it into a little ball and we're going to flatten it out again. Now we're just going to shape it the way we want to shape it. You know, you can shape it straight out like this, or you can oh, make it deadly. perfectly round if you want to. You can do this, and now you got... Oh, and now you got a heart! There a you go, hey, a heart. it's a Valentine's really? banner. <laughs> you can make it any way you want. Okay, so we're going to get our little baking tray out here. Okay. Nothing special about that. It's pretty level all the way around, right? And then we're just going to put it on the baking tray. 
my gosh. Yeah, there you go. Okay. There we go. So now, to make sure that it cooks all the way through, mm -hmm. we're just going to stop it. Then you're ready to go. Okay. Best to cook it at about 325, 350, depending on you know, how hot your oven gets. Everybody's okay. temperatures, you know, you get used to your different. own. Yeah, you get used to your own temperature. We throw it in the oven, and when we come back, it'll be ready. Well, here's to not burning down Shawnee's place. Woohoo! Well, check this bannock out, guys. She's all ready to go. Oh, it's so good. So it's cooled down a little bit now. Okay. You know, some people, you know, take it right out of the oven. You know, we put a little bit of uh, oil on top. You know, that's going to make the crust a little softer because that's the way I like it. Some people don't put anything on it and it makes it really crispy. Traditionally, with, when we make bannock, once it's ready to go, we stand it up like this okay. and we grab the corner like this and we just break a piece off. So now you got a you know, piece, it's ready to go. Now the band is gonna breathe and you can continue breaking pieces off if you're gonna feed everybody right away mm -hmm. or as it cools down, then you can cut into it. Okay. Okay, and then what, what it does is it maintains its texture. Right, and it doesn't get all gushy, you know. You know, mm -hmm. kind of. If you try to try to cut it right away, it's going to compress it too much. Okay. Okay, so you're going to lose the texture of the bannock. Oh, so there you go, bannock 101. Woohoo! Well, thank you so much, no Roger. Problem. I'm excited to eat this. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you. I had a great time. Mm -hmm. Thanks, guys. Aaron, master, put that on your resume. Master bannock maker slash almost burned down the kitchen slash I can make bannock, I'm snaggable. I'm snaggable, I'm wifeable, <laughs> wife me up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so what did you learn? What, 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 is, what is it that bannock represents now that you know how to cook bannock? Um, bannock, well, you know, besides bannock bums that come to mind, <laughs> um, I learned a lot about the ingredients and Roger talked about some of the history and stuff, so that was good. And uh, there's more to bannock than just uh, just keep going in my mouth. Really chewing on that. Okay. okay. Anyways, <laughs> if you have a chance to eat bannock, eat some bannock. All the gas stations in Regina, the uh, First Nation gas station, best bannock in town. Pick Ooh, some up. Or from this guy, he's really good and, too. Um, Five bucks a piece, though. So. This episode also had fatherhood. I just want to say I really do like you said earlier. Commemorate mm -hmm. and thank everyone who plays that figure of um, the, the male side, or even not even the male side, the female side, but giving that child that balance. So mm. thank you very much. Who's your daddy, Cadmus? Who's my daddy? My daddy is Bruce. Bruce. Oh, sounds strong. He's, he's, he's the strongest guy around. Never mess around with Bruce. My mom <laughs> would say, don't you move, boy, or I'll tell your dad. <laughs> The and I stopped right there. That's all he has. That's all my mom had to say. But great episode. Yeah, it was great. I really enjoyed um, our segments on the the cross and the Indigenous Games in Alberta. It's great to see our youth come out and uh, represent us. And I'm really excited about their futures in that. For sure. Mm -hmm. so with that, shall we move on? I think so. Uh, move on. I don't know. You know, the season finale is coming up next episode and uh, it's been, been quite the journey been hasn't fun. it don't miss next week season finale Reza check you later